Okay, so what I want to talk about today is emotions, affectivity, and talk about the role of meditation, how meditation can intervene, and how we can learn about the way in which meditation can work from understanding how consciousness uh, works, or at least according to the model I have laid out. Oh, another survivor is coming. <laughs> okay, so let me uh, <laughs> briefly go over what I have gone over in the last few weeks. There are obviously many ways to think about consciousness. In this course, I have contrasted consciousness, two models of consciousness, and focused more particularly on the model that I have elaborated, which I call the phenomenal field model of consciousness, right? The, the one of the way to understand what this drawing is about is to understand the process through which non-conscious stimuli become conscious. So, in this view, this is basically if you want a three steps view, versus the other model, which I won't talk about today, which is in a way a two-step view. So the three-step view is that we have non-conscious perceptual stimuli that come from the senses, right? It might be visual senses, might be hearing, it might be proprioceptive, it might be kinesthetic. In uh, modern cognitive science, there are way more than six senses, but that doesn't matter. All stimuli come through the senses. And at first they are non-conscious, but at some point they enter the field of consciousness. And the, in this model, the transition between what's non-conscious and what is conscious is in a way gradual. That is, it's hard to make a hard bound distinction between what is in consciousness from what is not in consciousness. Now, in this model, I distinguish what is in consciousness from what I am conscious of, right? Now, you may think, wow, this is bizarre. No, it's not. Suppose you have a, a boil on your foot, right? Uh, that boil in your foot, now, sometimes you pay attention, but if I had one today, I would try not to pay too much attention, and I would try to focus on what I'm saying. Nevertheless, in the back of my mind, that kind of really unpleasant sensation would be there, right? So, in this example, uh, what the boil is in my consciousness somewhere around here, but it's not what I'm focusing on. It's not what I'm paying attention to, right? What I'm paying attention to is this little black uh, <coughs> dot, which are what I would call the projected cognitive events, right? Now, depending on the Abhidharma, you can have only one at a particular time, or you can have several at the same time, like in the Yogacara Vidharma, I think actually probably there is more support for the second view, but that doesn't matter. The main point is to make a distinction between what is in consciousness and what is, the, what is paid attention, what I pay attention, the main object of consciousness. So in my case, uh, or the other example I give the other time, uh, last time, I think, is that if I'm looking for an object in a room, my uh, intention to look for the object is in the back of my mind, but it's not the object that I'm focusing on. I'm focusing on different parts of the room and trying to look at, uh, trying to find the object, right? 
So as long as I have not found the object, I'm looking at the room. Nevertheless, in the back of my mind, there is this intention of finding the object, right? And so I would argue that this part of the mind is part of consciousness. It's not something which is completely hidden to us, but it's not what we directly pay attention to because we are conditioned in a way to pay attention to the external world and we are conditioned not to pay a whole lot of attention to what is happening inside, right? Because, uh, well, if you think from an evolutionary perspective, what is happening outside of us is potentially quite dangerous. If we think ourselves as hunting with Lucy somewhere in Africa, and uh, so what is important is what come at us, right? And so we are really conditioned to look outside. But there is a whole bunch of things which may be in consciousness, which we are dimly aware of, but not completely uh, unconscious either. And so that's what I've called the phenomenal field model of consciousness. We start for perceptual processing, we go to consciousness, phenomenal consciousness, and then attention, which sometimes we can gloss as access consciousness, that is the object that I am directly accessing versus the feeling objects that are in the background uh, of my so mind. Here. These are the perceptual processing. This is the consciousness. Yeah. This is the thing that is attended. That's right, and this too. <laughs> yeah. For example, I can be thinking here, while at the same time I have feeling of my f feet on the ground, right? This is probably my main object, especially for me, because I'm always caught by thinking. And then, but this is also in my field of attention. And then there is a whole bunch of things uh, which are in my consciousness, but not the object of my attention, right? And then I put also on the, on the board the model, uh, one of the models that is suggested in the early sutta uh, and in the early sutras, the early teachings, the early canon that records what is attributed, or the teaching attributed to the Buddha, right? And that's quite interesting as well. Okay, uh, where it starts is this idea of contact, right? If you look at the sutta, often it says independence on contact arise, uh, feeling arise, uh, vedana, sanya, and so on. So contact. Uh, Sorry, I made a big mistake here. It's not jeda, it's jeda now. Oh, yes, indeed. So, for me, contact is somewhere around here, is when the objects start to enter consciousness, right? That object can come from the senses, it can be a mental object. There are many sources from which we get objects that come into consciousness. I also emphasized uh, the importance of what I call proprioceptive awareness, which is a great example of phenomenal consciousness, is this consciousness that we have of our entire body, right? Uh, Sometimes we think we are here, but actually our consciousness is not here, it's in the entire body, right? It's, in, it's only when I think that I think I am here and looking down, but really when I act in the world, I'm not here. I'm in, in my entire body, right? And so my entire body is this field of consciousness, which is something that comes in here, right? It's not like I'm paying attention to my consciousness. When I talk to you, I'm not paying much attention to my body, and I've been reproached several times 
that, uh, that problem <laughs> by somebody whose name remain, uh, will remain a name. But uh, I'm still aware of my body, right? At all times, I know more or less where my feet, where my arms uh, uh, are, right? So this consciousness that pervades the body is what is called proprioceptive awareness. And I've talked in a previous uh, session how important it is and what happens when this proprioceptive awareness uh, is missing. So that's another example of uh, this kind of phenomenal field of consciousness, which I think uh, is the precondition for the more focused forms of attention, right? So for me, PASA is the first kind of contact between the consciousness and the object in the sense that the stimuli is coming into consciousness and start to be processed, right? I say that because sometimes PASA is understood in a purely causal role, which is probably part also of uh, the story, but I think it's already part of consciousness, and that's uh, where it starts. And then there are three very important uh, aspects of mental factor which comes in. Now, I don't know if there is an order between Sanya and Vedana, but they're extremely important uh, to understand. Actually, all three are extremely important to understand how Buddhist, or at least one way in which Buddhists understand consciousness. So, independent on Sanya, on uh, Pasa, sorry, uh, two very important factors. Vedana, which is the feeling tone that arises. That is when I have an experience. And uh, that experience is always colored by a certain feeling tone. Either it feels good or it doesn't feel good. It feels not good, right? That's, from a Buddhist perspective, extraordinarily important. And I will come back again and again because meditation is, mostly I'm talking about mindfulness here, is aimed at dealing with Vedana, right? In, that's per, perhaps the most central factor from a Buddhist perspective, right? And then Sanya is discernment, meaning making distinctions uh, in terms of the object. And I talked about in a previous class how this is a difficult uh, one to understand because, and I'm going to come back today, because it looks like we make distinction or discernment on the base of language, but I think it's important to understand that there is a pre-linguistic way to make distinction and this is what I want to talk about today, because my argument is going to be that, contrary to a lot of Western views about consciousness, the Buddhist view is a kind of bottom-up view. It's not a top-down view, though obviously the top-down and the bottom-up dimension are both important in the mind, and I will talk about that. By top-down, I mean consciousness understood as mostly being about thinking, right? In the Western, uh, often the Western model of action, maybe we can write that, is belief, desire, action. That's what I call the top-down model, which is reflected in the dominant views about morality, which thinks about morality as a question of choice, right? I think and then I act, right? That's what I call the top-down model. And that's the dominant model uh, in Western cognitive science. It's not the only one, but it's certainly the dominant one. And obviously, it's a one 
which is most prone to be modeled by artificial intelligence, right? Because all the work is done in terms of beliefs, right? Thinking beliefs. That obviously goes back to Descartes and much further, right? The bottom-up uh, version, maybe we want to write that, which I think is much more germane to the Buddhist way of thinking about the mind, talks about affect, desire, action. So this is a contrast that I'm going to draw today between this top-down model and this bottom-up model. Obviously, these are models because it's obvious that both dimensions are, are important, right? Thinking is obviously important, and we'll see when we talk about emotion that the role of thinking is important. But in that model, what is primary is what I call affect, right? What's affect? Affect is a fairly large category, which comprise what? Emotions. Now, you may think, oh, yeah, emotions. Buddhism has a lot to say about emotions. Well, in a way, yes. In another way, no, because in Buddhism, there is no concept of emotions. But, obviously, Buddhism has to say a lot about emotion, despite the fact that the concept is largely uh, absent uh, from Buddhist language. In Tibetan, I wouldn't know uh, how to say emotion. In Thai, kwam rusuk. Arom. Arom means more mood, right? But, yeah. It's interesting, Buddhist languages don't seem to have exactly... Why? Because, obviously, the way we... Uh, divide the mind is uh, in part culturally dependent, right? And now distinction between emotion and reason comes basically from Plato, uh, which makes this tripartite distinction between emotion, appetites, and uh, reason, right? And that is not the way Buddhists understand uh, the mind. <coughs> So, the word I use is affect because it contains emotions, but it contains moods. What's the difference between a mood and an emotion? Uh, usually the, the answer is that the, uh, uh, an emotion is short-lasting, whereas a mood is kind of pervasive for a long time. That's usually the distinction that is made. More important is in affect we include Vedana, right? that is the feeling tone of the experience. Because from a Buddhist perspective, this is really what starts the whole chain of reaction, right? Upon Vedana comes aversion or attachment, and then all the other emotions that uh, uh, we know about. So this is why I call this model bottom-up, right? because it starts in the, at the bottom, which is with the feeling tone of the experience. And then we have chetana, which is the intention, right? And I talked about last time how intention is not just something which is uh, thinking, but is something which is much more embodied than just mere thinking. So I emphasize how in Buddhism, there is obviously the motivation that we have to do something, but then there is the action of doing something, and the action itself, the embodied action, is intention. So from a Buddhist perspective, even intention has to be understood from his bottom-up perspective, and not just as something that happened in our thinking, right? Any question about that? Yes? Absolutely. If you think about how you're going to program a computer, uh, 
this is where you start from, right? Belief. Not in the sense that we hold belief, but a, a certain number of facts that are known and what derives from these facts, right? And some of these facts are not just facts about what, uh, what is in the world, but also derived from what we want to do, right? So most, if you think about how you would pros uh, program a computer, this is where you start from, right? So if you're programming a computer to drive a car, yes. you would start with killing people is bad. Well, there is a whole bunch of belief that you need to program in about what's the landscape looking like and what needs to be done and what doesn't need to be done and where we want to go and so on, right? And from belief, you get to action, right? By desire, I just mean intention. So is, is belief coming from outside, from information outside? It's, it's based on information, yeah. If you think about m dominant views of mo morality uh, in the West, not the only one, but dominant view of morality, morality is about decisions, right? What kind of decisions we make. As if our actions were decided by decisions. But they're not. Some are. But if you go with this model, which I think works much better for Buddhists, most of our actions are actually not based on decisions. They're based on either re reflexes or habits or kind of, yeah, habits plays a large role, right? When I wake up in the morning, there are a bunch of actions that I do which are kind of semi-automatic. I mean, I'm not a zombie, but uh, almost. And, you know, I go and I uh, turn on the tea kettle and do a sort of brush my teeth and so on. And it's not like I make decision to do that. I may have made the decision many years ago, but it's basically the habits I follow, right? So a lot of our actions are not based on, I would argue, on belief. They're not based on decision. They're based on habits, uh, automatism, reflexes, and so on. And decisions come, but for me, decisions come pretty rarely, right? Do I want to get out of the house at 9.30 or 10.30? OK, that's a decision. And then I make it in function of what I have to do during the day, and so on. But so far in, the, in my day, that's probably the first decision that I have to make. Everything else so far has been done probably more or less automatically. OK, I decide to go to fitness or not. That might be a decision. By now, it's pretty much a habit. I just do it, right? Also, for example, uh, uh, you, you have interesting, if you think about actions in sports, when you do sport and you're good at sport, you have what we could call expert actions, right? Ex and in expert actions, uh, you don't think about what you're doing, rather you do it out of habit and you monitor what you're doing uh, kind of from the corner of your mind. So it's not entirely habitual, but it's certainly, if you're good, I know football because I, I used to play football. If you're a good footballer, you just see where you're going to shoot, put the ball. You don't think about where you're putting the ball. If you think you're done, then the ball is taken away from you, right? So expert actions is another example of actions that are not based on decisions, but that are based on a kind of complex interaction between a kind of bottom-up agency, kind of a habitual way of doing things, which is probably even imprinted in the muscles, right, or in the nervous systems that command the muscle, with a kind of monitoring that is done, because obviously you, your, your brain is constantly monitoring what you're doing. So it's not like the top-down dimension is absent, but it's also not the case 
that this is what drives the action, right? You, the bottom up. Yes. The effect would be the habit. Uh, the effect is here. The, the choice. Like you have to make a choice so that. No, we don't have to make choice. No, what I'm saying, like I'm trying to understand. Yes. The here is based on it's belief, like decision, thinking, choices. decision, choice. Here it's habitual, automatic. It's semi-automatic, habitual, maybe better than automatic, right? And feeling. And feeling. A lot of it comes from how I feel, right? In sport, uh, people who are good at doing things, uh, they have, I mean, when a, a, a soccer player is on, he, they say he has the right feeling, right? He feels the, the, the situation, he feels the ball, what? In the zone, exactly. And that's a kind of, Effect. yeah, bottom-up action, right? Yes? You're using the word Chetra, George. Uh, a better word and better for your model would be Sankara. The trouble is you've got 50 Sankara and I can't fit them on the board. <laughs> <laughs> no, often Sankara does mean it does mean Chetana, right? That's the word you use in this model anyway. Yeah. That's fine. No, because I like the idea of Sankara. It's the idea of bringing things together, right? Construction, yeah. It's yeah. And so you can see how it goes from through contact to Sanya and Vedana. And then you respond to the situation, right? You bring the together and you act, right? And that action doesn't need to come from thinking. It's, there is a lot of action which is just embodied, right? Which is either habitual or just a, a way we are used to uh, act more or less semi-automatically, right? For example, when we drive, uh, it's not like we think about how to drive, right? We just drive. And then uh, sometimes, and then you can see that when we drive, we are more or less conscious, right? Uh, sometimes we are fully conscious because it's really difficult situation. Sometimes we are less conscious, and then uh, it obviously gets a little dangerous. And you know, sometimes we do things. Uh, for example, last time I talked about how. Uh, near my house, I'm supposed to go right to my house and straight to the college. And often I want to go straight, but actually I turn right. And it's not I'm completely unconscious, but it's this zone of chetana, of intention, which is kind of semi-conscious, right? And that's what we are talking about. Any other question? So, you see, uh, oh, sorry. I don't really understand, what if you have to make a decision in life? Oh, you do. <laughs> so, you make the decision here, then you act. Okay. This is not saying that this never happens. Okay. What is just saying is that this is not how we act in the world for the most part. But we make decisions based on what we like and dislike. Yeah, but we do make decisions. And obviously these decisions are conditioned by a whole lot of experience that come. But in, in Western cognitive science, the very term cognitive science tells you uh, where it's going. It's thinking about human being as being driven by cognition. And so in this, the typical expression of this model when it comes to action is that I make a choice and then I act, right? Now, clearly that happens. Around 8 to 9.30, I have to make this really big decision about whether I get out of the house at 9.30 or 10.30. That's probably, the, for me, the first decision that I make in my own experience. Now, I talk to my friends who believe in this model, and they tell me uh, that they make decisions all the time, and I literally don't understand what they are talking about. There is a term called decision fatigue. 
big, you know, as a coach actually. Yes, sure. I think yes. From one to the other, like mm -hmm. repeat enough so you don't have to make decisions. Yes. Who the decisions? Yes. Decision. When you go to the supermarket in America and you have 50 types of cereals, right? You're like, oh my God, I wish they had only one, right? <laughs> so, Cognitive science emphasizes a lot this model because obviously, if you, cognitive science is based on making models of human cognition and models that are computational. And so if you want to make a computational model of an action, that's how you're going to do it, right? But my argument in this whole course has been that the computational model is not a good way to understand human beings. Now, in this crowd, probably this goes down pretty well. I usually teach uh, to students who basically are kind of married to their uh, cell phones, to their uh, smartphones, and who basically cannot envisage life uh, without looking at their uh, smartphones uh, every five minutes or every two minutes or every one minute. And so uh, for my students, I have to work really hard to try to push the point that computers are probably not a good way to understand how human being functions in the world because human being function in this bottom-up model much more than in this top-down model. And if you think from an evolutionary perspective, it obviously makes complete sense because animals may have some thinking or not, we will talk about that, but certainly uh, it's pretty clear that they are pretty much directed by uh, affect. And uh, 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 so the amount of with, to which they able, thinking intervenes in the, uh, uh, behavior of animal is not nil, but it's relatively small. And the lower you go down in the evolutionary scale, if you want, the more this model is going to obtain, right? And so if we think about human beings biologically, it makes total sense that no, this is how we function, but this happens also, but we shouldn't think that this is how, how we function uh, most of the time, right? Yeah? I, I usually oh. use the 80-20 a lot. And the what? The 80-20 principle, like 80%, 20%. I wonder if this would apply when you say a lot here and less here. What do you, what do you think? Well, yeah, maybe 80-20. Maybe. maybe. I'm probably an extremely unreflective person, so uh, I probably make fewer decisions than uh, my friend, uh, Melissa. So this is not a man versus woman question. Uh, she is a woman, and she tells me she makes decisions from the very second she wakes up to the, very, the last second she uh, is awake. And I literally don't understand what she's talking about, but you know. Uh, we're talking about models, right? And my suggestion is that this is a lot more how we function than that, right? So, in this, sorry. Oh, we're doing okay. In this model, uh, emotion is an interesting category, okay? And it's interesting also from a Buddhist perspective because I would argue uh, what meditation is really for is to deal with emotion, transform emotion, and so on, right? I think that's relatively uncontroversial uh, to say that. Obviously, in meditation, we may have experience of this to a certain extent. I think certain forms of meditation like Tibetan open presence and maybe certain meditations in the Thai tradition seem to be kind of uh, take this as a kind of 
spaces from which to meditate. You just open yourself to, you don't think, you just remain present and not, and just let thinking go through and just remain with there with awareness, right? And that's maybe can be understood as a way to look, not to look, but to have a certain experience of that. But for the most part, meditation is for the sake of self-transformation, right? Is for the sake of transforming the way we uh, experience the world and the way we react and act, right? So in that process, obviously, emotions are really important, right? <laughs> so what are emotions? And I want to talk a little bit about the debate that is going on in cognitive science about the nature of emotions. And then we'll be basically done with our course. So what do you think emotions are? This is what we feel when our needs are met or not met. What's that? What we feel when our needs are met or not met. Okay. Well, I'm English and I'm male, so don't ask me. Don't ask you. Okay, I won't ask you. <laughs> Anybody? The way I think of it is more like the feelings, emotions, uh, more refined mental activity. Okay. Well, feelings we use for just a feeling tone of the experience, right? So feeling, it's either positive negative or neutral, right? Then emotions. Well, one way to uh, understand emotions is that, first is to say that emotions are really important. And here we are talking about the word of Damasio, right? Uh, really important to understand how human beings function and to understand consciousness. Emotions, if you want, are probably evolutionary developed, routine that allows us to make very quick decisions uh, in the world, right? That's probably the best way to understand emotions. They're routine in the sense that they are preset responses that we have to certain events. When I see something coming at me, I have fear, right? Now, it's, it's not something I think about. It's something which comes kind of spontaneously, right? It's a kind of appraisal that I make of the situation, and that's how I respond immediately, right? Something good happens, I like it, right? It's not like, I really decide, oh yeah, this is, I think it's good, why it's good, because, no. It's just a very quick response that I have to events uh, in the world, right? Everybody is on board? So this is why emotions are really important, because without emotions, we are not able to function. That's at least the Masio argument, and I think it's a really good argument. There is a, his book, he has several books, he has written many books. I think Descartes' Error is a really good book uh, in which he looks at a, uh, a patient, uh, an old, it's an old story of a guy whose head was penetrated by an iron bar, right? I think. Phileas Gage. Yes, Phileas Gage. And prior to that, Phileas Gage was, seemed to be a nice guy, fairly balanced and so on. And when, after this accident happened, he recovered? Can, can we just, because it's quite a graphic story, it's quite nice. Do you want to go into the story? I was going to avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty... A, he was a miner and... Finger. He's a railway man. Railway man, right? His, his job was, uh, when they were mining out the cliff faces to lay the railway track, uh, they would plant explosives inside the rocks. So they drill a hole and they plant an explosive inside. And then you take an iron bar to pack the explosive into the bottom of the hole. 
and then they would pack the hole up and explode it. But when he was using the iron bar to pack the explosive, it went off. And it drove the iron bar through his cheek and out the top of his skull, through his entire head. And weirdly, obviously he fell over, but a few seconds later he gets up. And he walks around and he carries on as absolute normal. Even though a stop it. <laughs> Even though a you know a thick iron bar that's this long went straight the way through the middle of his skull. And if you look on YouTube, you can see his skull and the iron bar. They're both displayed in the museum. So his case is very famous. Yes. But the important thing was that he carried on, for a period, he carried on acting and working as normal. Yes, but his emotions were greatly affected. And so he started to make terrible choices. Why? Because emotions, his emotions, didn't really work well. So emotions are this kind of preset routine that allows us to make choices more or less automatically without having to think too much about the situation. Right? Now, sometimes we have to think, but most of the time actually our thinking is probably driven by, this, by our emotions, emotions which come from the affects, which are part of the affect. And it's pretty clear that most of the thinking that we make when we take decisions is kind of oriented already by the emotions that we have. Now, I wouldn't say this is always the case, but I think it's very often the case, and also very often we don't really need to think because obviously if something is coming at my head, I don't have the time to think. I need to get out as quickly as possible. And so fear is a very important emotion, and you can see how fear is, cannot be a question of belief. It has to be much more kind of gut level reaction than uh, driven by some kind of rational estimation, right? So emotions are these preset routines that were presumably evolutionarily developed, right? And which allows us to make all kinds of decisions in life. So you see, this works really well in my model because affect is rooted in Vedana, in the feeling tone of experience, which brings about a certain emotional reaction, right? Yes? Yeah, I read an article, I only read one article about it, but there was some kind of psychological phenomena in Japan where they found people, mostly young people in their teens and early 20s, who said that they never had any emotions. They were never happy, never scared, yes. never angry, never excited. And they just functioned, but they were still able to function. They did their job, or they went mm -hmm. to school. And uh, if you say, ask them, do you like your job? They just say, it's my job, I do it. And, but they're still able to function. Yes. I, first, they still have emotion, but they are probably not aware of it, right? You remember here there is a lot of stuff happening, which are not completely unconscious, like in the Freudian sense of the word, but which are not thematically in the forefront of our awareness, right? So the fact that they didn't notice emotion doesn't mean they didn't have it. It means just they were not trained to pay attention to them, right? And also it's a case that habits go a long way, right? So habits go a long way uh, in helping us to function, but I would say these people have emotions, they're just not aware of it because they're trained to ignore them and to push them in the background, right? Uh, it's also pretty clear that to pay attention to emotion is, uh, is kind of a skill that we need to develop, right? Because naturally, 
uh, we are inclined to look to the outside world because the outside world is where danger comes from, right? And so naturally we tend to look at the outside world and so it takes a, a, a culture to kind of get used to look inside, right? Right, so culture would probably make a big difference. Jeff. Yes. Culture would be focused on do your work or do your job. Yes, yes. And then the other culture is where your emotions and your feelings would be given much more value. That's right. <coughs> so, in a way, we can go right to this idea of what are emotions? Are they cognitive? Are they physical? What are they? In the traditional literature, there is Western and modern literature, there is a different two view, one which I call the Stoic view, which is defended nowadays by Martha Nussbaum, which is that emotions are judgments that we make about situations. And then there is the other view, which is William James' view, which is that emotions, emotions are primarily physical, and that uh, we kind of attribute content to this physical reaction that happens in us, but it's just an attribution. Really, what emotions are is this physical reaction, right? So you have these two very different views in modern literature, uh, which is one says that emotions are judgments. This is the stoic view. Whereas the other view is emotions are kind of physical feelings, right? To which we attribute uh, content. Uh, since I teach young people, I, tend, I tell the young guys that a great way to get uh, girls to like you is to go on a bridge uh, which looks like kind of dangerous because her heart rate will increase and she will interpret the feelings which is coming from there as liking you. So this is a good way to get a girl to like you, but this audience probably uh, doesn't apply to it. So uh, we can speak, skip this kind of adv advice. But it is an example how the physical actually does induce sometimes uh, certain emotions. Well, well, this was a famous experiment in the 1970s, late 70s, where they had a... Uh, an attractive girl would go and ask guys to fill out a questionnaire and then she would give them her car and say if you have any questions you can always call me up and the test was how many guys would call her up and ask her for a date and if they did this on a bridge more guys would call her up and ask her for a date than if they did it on a regular road so this was a it's not just a funny example of George's, this was an actual yes, yes. famous experiment that was done. And indeed, uh, guys phoned her up more if, if they were asked on the bridge than if they were asked on the street. So, yeah. The idea being that the bridge makes you a bit nervous, and you interpret that nervousness as feeling attraction to the girl. Okay, so you see these two very different views. One which says, Emotions are conceptual. The other which say emotions are physical, right? These are two standard views in the philosophy of uh, emotion. Apparently, if you put uh, a pen between your no, teeth that way, that way yeah. it makes you happier, right? Well, <laughs> compared to the pen in the lips. OK. <laughs> Compared to that. Yeah. Yes. And again, they, they ask people to judge a story, how funny it was. Yeah. And the variable factor was they had to hold a pen <laughs> in their teeth or their lips. And if you hold the pen in your teeth, you will find the story more funny than if you hold the pen in your lips. Yeah. Yes. So, what do we make of this, right? Uh, how do we think about uh, emotions, 
especially if we think in this way. And, <laughs> well, okay, before I go into that, let me talk about this debate too, which is, well, uh, well maybe not, let me hold on this debate. Okay, so what are emotions? We have these two extreme views. Uh, the way I deal with it is thinking about emotion. We need to write this on the, on the board as what I call, and it's not my terminology, but I really like it, is embodied appraisal. Which, which side? It's between. Okay. It's, it's in between the two. So, embodied appraisal. This is trying to put the two together, right, in a way. Uh, embodied appraisal. It means that uh, emotions at the basic level uh, are not necessarily conceptual judgment, but they do have some kind of cognitive function. And that's what I call appraisal. And why it's embodied? Because obviously I want to have William James as, as well, which means that this appraisal is uh, mental as well as physical at the same time, right? So for example, fear, when I see something coming at me, that's what I would call an appraisal, right? My brain, my mind is quickly appraising the situation and I have this reaction of fear because I perceive that there is something dangerous coming at me. Okay? Did you? I just wanted to know if you make a distinction between emotions and feelings. Yeah, yes, I do make a name. Uh, 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 Feelings is what I call the feeling tone, right, of the experience. Just the fact whether it feels good or bad. And feelings, together with sanya, give rise to certain emotional responses, right? For example, like, dislike. I have good feeling. I like it. I have bad feeling. I dislike it. I have aversion, right? This is a technical term in Buddhism. What? Feelings? A technical, yes. Yeah. I mean, normally people would... Yeah, feelings is like all over the place, right? Here we talk about feeling as a feeling tone of the experience. How the experience feels to me, right? Uh, I eat Swiss chocolate, and I really like it, right? So there is feeling tone in my mouth, and then there is this uh, liking reaction, which is an emotional reaction, right? Is a judgment? Well, here is the question. Is it a judgment or not? And this is a debate between what I've called here the constructivist and the essentialist, which is going on in the, well, let's call it affective science, but it's part, in a way, of cognitive science. It's also part of philosophy. What about my mind? <laughs> that, <laughs> at that point, there is so much judgment on it that uh, it's hopeless. If you, if you, but I am I, pretty confident that if it was introduced in my mouth, I would have this immediate reaction of intense dislike. I don't like Senovis either. So, <laughs> this debate is actually ongoing between the constructivist. Uh, there is a really good book by Ellen Barrett, which is called How Emotions Are Made. And this is really very popular by, among uh, cognitive scientists. I don't like it very much, but I think it's a really good book and it's a fun book to read. And her view is basically that this appraisal is 
a form of judgment. And therefore, she draws a consequence, which to me sounds kind of absurd, and we, my friend in class was trying to defend it, but he quickly gave up. It, the consequence is that for her, animals don't have emotions because they don't have judgment. Why they don't have judgment? Because they don't have language in which to formulate a judgment, right? Well, we don't know the language. <laughs> okay. Uh, there is this other side. Well, the question then is, does my dog love me? Okay, we'll get to that because uh, there is a question of which emotions animals have, right? This is why a person like Temple Grandin, I highly recommend her writing. She is really great with uh, animal emotions because obviously uh, the problem with animal emotions is that first, one thing that you need to know is that we don't have neurological signatures of emotions. So when we look at the fMRI or the EEG of a person, we cannot distinguish which emotion this person has or doesn't have, and that's the same for animals. So at this stage, we don't, not having neurological signature of emotion, it's pretty hard to guess what emotions animals have if they have any, right? But certainly one of the danger uh, uh, in talking about emo uh, animal emotion is anthropomorphism, right? Oh, my dog loved me and he feels so guilty because he pee on the carpet and so on, right? Yes, that's probably not what's going on, but that's an interesting question. The other side is represented basically by Darwin, and nowadays by a guy called, who just passed away, Panksepp, Jak Panksepp, who is probably the best person to read on the kind of the neuroscience of emotions. And he is of a very different view, which is that for him, embodied appraisal are not necessary judgments. That is, they start at a lower level, if you want what I, I have called in this course, the pre-reflective level. And then obviously are often picked up in human being by the reflective level and uh, all the cultural culture which comes into emotions. So in this um, here, obviously we need to understand uh, this model as involving an interaction uh, between the two. But in this model, where it starts here is with affect, which brings about kind of pre-reflective emotions, right? Like fear. Fear, I would argue, or Pangsep argue, and this is based on Darwin's view that uh, emotions are evolutionary developed, right? And that therefore human beings have inherited a certain number of emotions from the evolutionary past. But obviously in human beings, uh, there are three levels. There is another level, sorry, uh, which is the conceptual judgment level, right? So in human being, it gets much more complicated because you have this uh, maybe this pre-reflective uh, appraisal, which can get quickly integrated into a set of judgments which are heavily culture dependent, right? That's at least the way I would answer to Barrett uh, because I'm squarely favorable to this view. And I think embodied appraisal is a way to understand what these people are trying to do, which is they are trying to say emotions <coughs> are these affective or cognitive routines that are evolutionary developed, but obviously in human beings, that basic level gets superseded or gets combined by with a, a higher level of judgment, beliefs, culture, and so on. And so uh, in my view, animals have emotions, at least mammals and presumably birds too. And, but these emotions, uh, 
are not necessarily the same as human emotions. Because in human uh, judgment, thinking about identity, for example, right? Takes, makes uh, a, a big difference. For example, the way in which we think about identity, that makes a great deal of difference in the way we react to different events. Now, identity is <coughs> highly conceptual. It's judgment, it's culture, it's how we see ourselves. You remember, it's this uh, extended self, right, that I talked about in the last class, right? It's this self that we construct, which extends autobiographically over the whole span of our life, self which is interacting with other, which is part of a family, which is part of social group, which is part of a nation, and so on. And all these different identity are part of my identity, and they certainly influence a great deal about how I feel about events, right? When uh, well, you know, I'm Swiss, so Swiss, we have limited uh, occasion to be proud of our football players, but it happens once in a blue moon, and then when Switzerland wins, there is a little, my heart is a little, goes a little bit faster, and I'm like, yeah, good, good. Y yes, which, uh, to my point of view, is obviously complete nonsense, because it doesn't change my life. In, any yota, you know, people, some people say, uh, said, uh, France just, okay, in, don't get angry. France won the World Cup, right? <laughs> yes, don't get away. Uh, France won the, won the World Cup, and one person was saying, this is the greatest day in my life, and I thought, oh my God, what kind of life do you have? <laughs> but anyway, we do have this reaction, and these reactions are parts of the judgment that we make, and <coughs> they derive from the culture we are part of, we inhabit, right? But I would argue there is a lower level of uh, emotions which presumably uh, does not depend on the culture, but depends on what I've called the core self, right? Which is this... <coughs> uh, model that we have about ourselves, about ourselves acting in the world and so on, and a uh, model which supports this kind of preferential distribution of emotional and cognitive resources in which what concerns me is all important and what concerns you doesn't matter unless it concerns me indirectly, right? That kind of self is the basis for, I think, much more basic emotions. And to me, I am pretty much on that side. And from a Buddhist perspective, I think it makes no doubt that this side is where uh, there is, uh, which works the best with this kind of model. That is the fact that there is a pre-reflective level of emotion, anger, fear, and so on. <coughs> and then there is this more conceptual level of emotion, right? So, so does your cat actually hold you in contempt? <laughs> My cat? N no. <laughs> okay, uh, let me just make... Temple Grandin has a good uh, list of... Uh, she is uh, a, not a pers an autistic person on fairly far gone on the spectrum. Uh, and she has become uh, one of the foremost specialists of animal psychology because she thinks that the way she experiences the world is actually more similar to uh, the way animals uh, experience the world. And she has done a lot of work on animals and uh, animals' emotion and so on, and I highly recommend uh, her books. Temple Grandin. Her list is rage, chasing. Should I be writing these down? Probably not. It's just rage, chasing, fear, seeking, attraction, distress, and play. So no, your cat does not have contempt with 
for you. Uh, we can think about uh, where seeking the, probably distress, right? I'm talking about your cat. <laughs> My cat loves me. <laughs> What's that? I see. Yeah. My cat loves me, obviously. But yeah. So as you can see, this is a, a list. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the right list, but this is a list which looks pretty different from what human emo the kind of standard categorization of human emotion that we would give, right? Yeah. <laughs> There's um, biochemical processes that are associated with emotions that aren't associated with like, thinking and cognition, right? So there's hormonal systems, so it's quite fear. It's also yes. Different. Yes. Um, and, and perhaps also there's a different layer, right? So like, serotonin can be a reason, low serotonin can be a reason to be with depressed. Yes. Yes. Can you repeat the question? Uh, whether chemical reactions such as hormonal reactions have influence on the emotional process? The answer is obviously yes. Whereas being feeling guilty requires a moral system in place. Yes. Uh, Temple Grandin and Yak Pang said, do not think that dogs feel guilty. Now, it's open for debate, but they don't think that guilt, for example, uh, is what animals feel, right? They look guilty. Under yeah, they look, they look guilty, but no. Uh, but obviously, I don't know. But that's what they, they, they are talking about, right? Now, this is also why the term embodied appraisal, I think, is particularly adequate, because it suggests there is a bodily dimension, right? Yeah, you were going to say that um, oxytocin is a social cohesion so maybe dogs do love you. What's that? Dogs do have oxytocin in their system, which, is, which we use as a social cohesion. Yeah, I think uh, I, I tend to be nervous when people go too far that direction, because I think the, the mind and the body are together, right? And so... I think it's way too simplistic to think of just like there is a hormone, therefore we have this emotion. I think there is a complex interaction. Yeah. But it's certainly true that in certain uh, uh, kind of pathological conditions, people get overwhelmed by certain kind of hormones, right? Like depression, for example. Uh, probably certain hormonal lacks thereof play a great, great role, right? But I think uh, uh, we always need to think body and mind as going together, right? And I think that's a more fruitful way to think about that. Okay, any other question? So you see what we have tried to do today is look a little bit about this, how the Buddhist model uh, compares to some of the discussion in uh, cognitive uh, science. The key point from a Buddhist perspective is the connection between feeling and the rest of the process, right? Feeling is actually an interesting uh, category uh, because probably feeling and sanya go together. There is a condition which is really interesting called pain asymbolia. Have you heard about that? Pain asymbolia. This is a condition in which people uh, have feelings, like, for example, they might feel something going through their hands, but they don't have this assessment that this is painful. This is bad. That this is bad. I mean, they know what. Pain is, but they don't uh, it's, it's, okay, let me read you the description I got from 
Because it's interesting from a Buddhist perspective, because Vedana is so fundamental. So the question for me here, for example, is Vedana already here or only here, right? OK, here it goes. Such patients report that they have pain but are not bothered by it. They recognize the sensation of pain but suffer little or not at all. Indifference to pain can also rarely be present from birth. These people have normal nerves on medical investigation and find pain unpleasant, but do not avoid the repetition of the pain stimulus, right? So it's interesting because uh, some Buddhist meditators are described as being able to deal with pain uh, more or less a little bit like that, right? Being aware of pain, but being not affected by pain. So people make, uh, uh, when they talk about pain, uh, they make a threefold distinction. I, I, let me put this on the table and then you can, uh, they talk about, do you want to write that? Sensory discrimination. Under a category pain. Yeah. What's the first one? Sensory discrimination. So that would be being aware of this is a prick, this is hot, the intensity, the location, right? Affective assessment. And cognitive. Uh, well, we should use, it doesn't matter, cognitive assessment can, is okay. Probably should be affective appraisal. Yeah, to be just to keep yeah. with the term we have used so far. So, So these are what is understood to be the three components of the normal pain feeling. Sensory discrimination, you know, it's a prick, it's hot, it's throbbing, and so on, right? With the location, the intensity, and so on. And then there is the effective appraisal. I guess it's the aversive element, right? And then there is a cognitive assessment, which is how I think about it, right? So okay. You put your hand on a hot stove. Can I drink? Yeah. So you put your hand in the hot stove. Actually, in the, that's probably not a good example because it apparently there is an automatic reaction that you have before you have pain, right? But you are in meditation, and your knees are killing you, right? So what's going on? Well, what's going on is sensory discrimination, the throbbing sensation in the knee, right? Really fun stuff, right? And then the effective appraisal that this is really painful. Yeah, but you see, it's not just I don't like it in a kind of conceptual way, right? This is basically embodied stuff, right? This is the same thing whether for human or for animals, right? What may be different is the third level cognitive uh, assessment, right? Because uh, in pain, uh, an important dimension also is the story I tell about my pain, right? And that story makes a significant difference. But that story is not the same as the effective appraisal. So the people who have pain asymbolia, they have this, and they probably have that, but they don't have this effective appraisal. And so they probably feel, so they have Vedana, I guess they have Vedana, right? But they are not affected by the Vedana, right? 
Well, they know the success is bad. Yeah, they, they don't have any aversion to it. They don't feel that. <laughs> so, discernment? Well, discernment is also operating at two levels, right? It's first discrimination, and then it's also probably or maybe even three level, but certainly then it's cognitive assessment, right? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. You wanted to talk about masochism and things of that sort. I'm thinking, for I'm, example, about uh, quite a few people apparently cut themselves. Oh, yes. Right? TV show about it right now. So where, where the, in fact, they seek out pain. I mm -hmm. my son did this because it, they did, until they did that, they didn't feel anything. And so they did it in order to feel. So how would that fit within this? That's what rugby players are doing, isn't it? Uh, what do you see the problem here? Can well, you in other words, the seeking pain. What's that? Generally, pain is... Yes. We flee from pain. Yes, I, I think... judgments about pain. Yes. There is a, a condition in which people are attracted to pain. Yeah, this is where there is a difference between these two levels, right? So it wouldn't be so much cognitive as it... No, I think it's mostly cognitive, but I'm not sure. I, I must say, sadom, um, sorry, masochism is something I have never quite experienced. So I have very little uh, phenomenological insight into that. But I wonder if it's here, not much more here, that this is going on. But I, I don't know. Yeah, another and, thing. Is it could be cultural, it could be something that's taught, like in Japan, for example, part of Japanese culture is to learn how to endure pain. Mm. That's yeah. a good thing. So when uh, someone is doing Zen meditation in Japan and their legs are killing them, they also sit there thinking, this is good for me. This, this is what? Good, this is a good thing that I'm doing. Okay. So here with my legs killing I've known several long term Zen monks around the having to have uh, knee surgery because they're taught that you're supposed to just sit there in the pain. Mm -hmm. so thinking, you know, Catholic monks with their hair shirts, yes. same thing, thinking that they're doing something good by physical suffering. Yeah, but I think if you look at the narrative of certain breakthrough in meditation, right, it looks like maybe some meditators are able to change this. So they still have a sensation, but they don't have any more this kind of aversive reaction to the pain. So they don't really, the kind of, the physical input is still there, but they don't feel it as pain, right? Well, they feel the pain, but their judgment of it is that it's a good thing. I think there are two dif distinct cases I, I would argue, but I'm not sure. I don't know if you have any opinion. One is that, yeah, you kind of, you have this pain and you endure it because you think it's a good thing, right? So the good thing endured the not so good thing. But I think certain narrative, I don't have that kind of experience, so I'm, whoever wants to take this on, I'm happy to hear. Uh, when you hear what they call breakthrough experience, right, in which they say, I will sit through the pain for hours, right? They talk about it, how at a certain stage they seem to be able to go kind of through the pain to a, a, a state in which they don't feel that anymore. Through the pain barrier. Yeah. That's, I don't have any experience of that, so I'm just reporting uh, what I read in the meditative literature, right? Alex? Uh, oh. Sorry, could you just write down the technical term of this? What's that? What is this condition? What is it? Pain? Oh, pain asymbolia. I mean, well, the, I suppose the best Buddhist example of this would be the Buddha's death. You know, the account has it that for many months he on and off, and experience real lacking. Yeah. And is an effective one. Yeah. That's... They said that this is painful stuff. Yes. The Buddha 
This is what I'm uh, hinting, is that maybe some deep state of meditation is in a way a little bit like Pena Symbolia, that is the ability to uh, bypass this kind of affective appraisal, right? And to just remain with this sensory discrimination. Right, I don't think it's about going through the pain barrier. That's just about putting up with pain and it hurts it again. I am stupid. No, uh, what I think uh, uh, Prabhandit was talking about is the report of certain meditators who talk about you know, when you're fairly advanced in meditation, but you're maybe not yet stream enter and you want to become stream enter, and you say, This night I will become stream enter, and you sit for 8, 10, 12, 16 hours. And some of these uh, meditators describe how they have unbearable pain, pain, but then they're able to go through it and probably get kind of get rid of that. Or no. Hey. The term pain barrier, I was thinking of runners. Yeah. And when you yeah. run, you, you experience it's yeah. unpleasant, but you push through that pain barrier, and then you experience like a euphoria. Not something that I've ever done, but I've read about it. Yeah, no, that's a good example, because you still have the sensory discrimination, but you don't have the effective appraisal, right? Because your system is over, overwhelmed of, by endorphins, right? And they're, they're changing physical states. Like that. Yes. The Buddha's pain, gastrointestinal pain, but it's not a changing physical state. Well, I would say that's where it is, right? Now, that's precisely my question. Uh, where, how deep can mindfulness go, right? It's certainly not able to change that. No. That's a stimuli, right? Well, so we have stimuli, appraisal, and reaction, right? For example, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, cognitive therapy, you have uh, stimuli, you have appraisal, you have intention, and you have action, right? That's one way to model the therapeutic intervention, right? So where do you act? You act between the intention and the action, right? You, you have all this intention to harm people, but through your therapy you're able to intervene in the chain and break the chain and not act out of your intention to harm others, right? For example, or to harm yourself. Okay, so we have stimuli, appraisal, intention, and action, right? Can the appraisal be changed by mindfulness and meditation? This is the interesting question, right? And this is one of the ways, obviously, that the Buddhist uh, that Buddhist meditation, such as mindfulness, is important in uh, transforming our affective, our emotional life, right? The question is, where does mindfulness intervene? Certainly intervenes at the junction between intention and action, right? Well, but now there is a link, appraisal intention, and then can mindfulness go back to the appraisal, or is the appraisal so automatic that it cannot be transformed by meditation? I'm going to let you have a drink so you can put your bottle down. Yes. Uh, in there's two versions of dependent origination where the cycle is broken. And in one of the versions, the cycle is broken after you see an object and you have Nama Rupa and uh, Sala Yatana, sense contact, Hatsa, Vedana, but then after Vedana comes uh, Tanha. Tanha, yeah. So one of the two different ways that you can break the cycle in Buddhism is 
Vedana is considered dependent on the object that you're looking at, but that does not have to go into uh, tanha craving. So that's one of the Buddhist um, lines that gets drawn here. Mm -hmm. Can I comment on that? So, Vedana, if you think in terms here, right, we make it a little bit more complex, and it looks like what you have is you break, well, either the connection from here to here or from here to here, right? Well, what you would be doing is you would have these three, but then the question is where do you go into craving? Well, this has already... I think, I think you would go into craving after the cognitive assessment. Well, here is all, liking is the beginning of craving, right? Well, that's the point, that between liking and craving in Buddhism, there's a yes. split. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I'm trying to think from a Buddha, how do we think about this process of feelings in terms of Buddhist distinction between Vedana and Tanha, right? Does mindfulness or meditation is able to affect this, or is it appraisal and then we cut it? here, right? This is my question. I'm not going to answer, but I think from a Buddhist perspective, that's not an uninteresting question. Any question about that? Uh, by the way, we have 20 minutes left and then the whole course is finished. Yes, so, this is the last chance. Yeah. So your questions can start to get a bit more general, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, the other day, a person asked me, what would I do if I had an arhat and I could make experiment uh, with an arhat? An arhat is a fully liberated person. And uh, the person said, would you want to put that person in an in a fMRI? And my answer is probably not. What I would be really interested in to see is whether that person has any fear or not. That would be a really interesting question. And I have no idea what the answer would be, but that would be, and that's easy to experiment, right? You create a situation of physical danger and you see how the person is reacting. That would be, to, for me, a really interesting question to see whether it's possible to be completely free from uh, an emotion like fear, or whether fear is so inbuilt that it can never be completely overtaken, right? Well, the the ahat are usually described as being without fear, right? Um, I don't know. Yeah. But I do know that the uh, advanced so-called advanced meditators that were put in the fMRI uh, had a lower startle. Yes. So that could be relevant to... Okay. The, that means that they were less startled by a sudden noise or something that happened than a regular person. So if that's something that you fancy, just do 20 years of meditation. <laughs> that would be the experiment I would be interested in making. Well, um, yeah, I, I wonder. Yeah, you cannot survive for a long time. But, well, you yeah, no, I know. Uh, it, it's a really interesting question. For example, last time I talked about three selves the uh, extended self, the core self, and the minimal self, right? And the minimal self is just the unity that we experience in the moment of our subjectivity, right? This is happening to me versus the core self in which I make a distinction, not conceptual, but uh, uh, at least not conceptual at this kind of level between me and others. And then the extended self, which is a self of identity, right? So, for example, 
it's pretty clear that uh, the emotions we attach to the self of uh, identity, right? The pride that I felt when Switzerland qualified for the World Cup and then after turned into sadness when they were uh, sadly defeated. That kind of emotion has to do with my identity, right? The, I would think fear is, has mostly to do with what I would call the core self, right? The danger to me as this entity which is distinct from the rest of the world, right? And you're right, it has a survival value. There is a question. So the question before is whether the, there is any kind of emotionality in the minimal self, right? The lowest level of self-formation, which is just the fact that this is happening to me. I guess from a Buddhist perspective, I would say no, but I really don't know. And I would love to understand more about, uh, w for example, your question, what is the kind of actions or how is the action of the arhat different from the action of the ordinary person if that arhat has no uh, emotions like... What's that? He's not discriminating between things he likes and dislikes. Yeah, so how does he act? How does he survive, right? So yes. this question came up in yeah. Theravada commentary. This is much later than you know, early Buddhism, but they had this question about an arahat. If you become enlightened, like how do you look after yourself? Because you no longer need to have a want to live. And their answer was, that you must ordain as a monk within seven days or you would die. Yes. Yeah, yeah I heard that. Because that. the story... Yes. So the idea is that if you're enlightened, well, you wouldn't need to try and survive. And only if you're a monk and then people would come and feed you would you actually be able to survive. This is much later than the Buddha. This is a commentarial uh, assessment of that question. Yeah. But it shows this question was being asked. Yes by Buddhists a couple of hundred years after the Buddha. Yeah, because most of our actions are done in this way, right? There is the affect, which starts with Vedana, right? And then this affect uh, brings about uh, an intention, right? Together, there is an emotion which brings about an intention, and we act, right? But if you don't have... Uh, any emotions, what makes you act, right? That's your question, and that's my question too. I don't know. In the Buddhist literature, for example, when they talk about the action of the enlightened one, there are all kinds of discussions, and in some of the Mahayana model, the Buddha is said to have no intention and to act like uh, a cloud that pours rain over uh, the natural world, right? The Buddha pours his teaching over the natural world without any intention. I have no idea what that means. None whatsoever, but it is to say that this is a, a really interesting and central question uh, to understand how uh, enlightenment is understood in terms of this model of human behavior and how this human behavior, what kind of transformation is happening through meditation. Yeah? Uh, I suppose um, an older period of tradition would be the Buddha after he has attained his awakening and thinks, nobody will understand me. I really will be a hassle. I can't be asked to do this. And then the god Brahma comes to him. Say I can't be asked. He says it's has to. So wearisome would it be for me? <laughs> well, yeah, he uses a word which, you know, is a word you use when it thinks it has to. Okay. Um, that's my colloquial interpretation. But the god Brahma then comes and says, okay, my son, enter Harry and now. You know, you've, you've done it, so why would you just die? So far. 
And then what goes the mother is compassion. Yeah. Or, like, yeah. So but but pity. Yeah, it is kind of an, emo an emotion. You're right. Well, okay, that's maybe a good point to end. So hopefully you see what we have done in this course. Talked about consciousness from a cognitive science perspective and tried to bring Buddhist myths. And I guess we started mostly with cognitive science and phenomenology, and today we end up with enlightenment. So how better can we finish? Thank you.